Cool. I'm excited to answer any questions. Um, if we could just kick off maybe by talking about your career before becoming a business owner, Matt Pat. Uh, so I went to FIT and well, actually first I went to Otis and we had this thing called foundation year. Um, and I found it very frustrating not being able to just start what I wanted to do immediately. Um, and so I transferred to FIT and I did, um, I did the fashion design program and international trade and marketing. So a dual major. And then at the same time I had, I was interning at uh, Narciso Rodriguez and Jason Wu where I learned a lot and um, simultaneously was making flower crowns. Uh, FIT is right next door to the flower mart, as I'm sure you guys know. And I found this little store that had these paper flowers and I fell in love with them. And I started making these flower crowns for friends, for different events, for their birthdays, like, you know, anything monumental in their lives happened, I would send them these crowns. And my whole life, I'd collected vintage fabrics. Um, and so I started cutting up the scraps and making like wired headbands, uh, basically hair scarves for your head that stayed in. And that's what I was doing. And then when I was graduating, I was ready to move home. And I was spending time just sketching a couture collection, which I thought was my path. Um, that I had named Gaia Osto, but friends of mine and, you know, everywhere that anyone would wear these crowns, people would stop us and be like, oh my God, you're the girls with the flowers in your hair. And it became this like cult-like thing at the time. And so I just, thinking this is like my side hustle, I took pictures of friends um, wearing the crowns for their birthdays and everything. and posted them and made a website, learned how to make a site and went from there and it took off. That's great. Where does Gaia come from? Gaia is the goddess of mother earth and the daughter of chaos. And to me, those are very, you know, two very creative forces and nice. sources of inspiration for me. Oh, it's the cults for that. I like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so you started to touch a little bit on your time here at FID, FIT. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about it. Um, you know, obviously your flower crowns were a big, uh, part of your experience here, but also wondering how you got your internships, how, you know, what you found about those experiences. So anyone I met in New York, I'd ask a lot of questions and I think I'd encourage everyone to constantly ask. And I had a friend named Bona who was friends with people in the industry. She was older and kind of like a mentor to me. Um, and they both connected me with Narciso and with Jason. And in both those internships, I kind of was willing to do absolutely anything. Um, no, yeah, I mean, I would do anything ever <laughs> that they asked. <laughs> yeah. And for me, it was really exciting to learn um, and I think with one of the biggest things, especially looking back at being in college is, and interning is the only time people are willing to teach you. Once you're in the field, you're expected to know mm -hmm. so much more. So, yeah. Um, what is the craziest story from your experience at Narciso? At Narciso, I don't remember a crazy story from Narciso. Um, from Jason Wu, during market, I was I was like dressing the models and changing them constantly, but also to pick up samples from the factory. There was just wasn't enough time. Oh wow! And so I was running and running back and forth, and I got and I actually got worn down and exhausted, and. I really couldn't say anything or tell anyone. Um, I think it's probably different now, but back then it was, it's very cutthroat. I mean, maybe in New York, it still is. LA is a lot more laid back. <laughs> Are you from LA? 
I'm from LA, right? Yeah. Right. Um, but being at FIT, I don't know about you guys, but I had every night was like an all nighter. And I still hear that a lot, I think. <laughs> I was in a program, I was in an accelerated program. So I was in a program with people who were way, way better than me at everything. Um, and I think in a way, it was really hard at the time, but looking back, it made me level up or aspire to be able to do more, even though I couldn't, I really couldn't keep up with how good everyone else was with sewing. I was really bad at pattern making. I was really bad at sewing. Um, and I had a professor, I don't know if they're, all the professors when I was was there were like older men. Mm. <laughs> you feel it's that the case? No. no, no, that's good. <laughs> I, it was actually amazing because they were these like old, it, it like these older men who worked in tailoring or in fashion back in the day wow. with like Domino's and the, you know, these icons. Um, yeah. So I think in a way it was a special experience. That's awesome. Um, what do you feel like is the most important thing that you learned while you were here in undergrad? Um, to have grit. Um, I think it was really important to build and foster relationships with all your professors and teachers. I think that's how I got by. Um, and make sure you find, you know, the good ones and build relationships. They can all be mentors to you. Um, I had, and it just takes one person to believe in you. I had a professor, I forgot his name, uh, but he said, Jazz, you're not going to fit. You're not going to, um, passed this test I like glued my dress together and <laughs> he's like but the design is amazing and you're going to be very successful just got to find someone else to sew it for you basically <laughs> yeah, exactly well Which that is was the hardest thing for me at FIT FIT is very technical yeah yeah it, I, it's hard for a lot of people I think but sense. I think it's so yeah. important to know that knowledge yeah do you still keep in touch with any of your professors no, that's why I want to come back. I want to come yeah. Say, yeah. Yeah. Well, you can still come back next week. I know you're going to be in town. You can pass through. Yeah, I'm going to try to come by. Um, there's one professor, Guillermo. Is he still there? He treat, he teaches international trade and marketing. Anyone know him? Do you know his last name? Um, I don't I know don't, personally, but no. no. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Is there anything that you wish that you'd studied more of while you had the time here? or done more of in New York City, knowing that your time was only- I wish I got to do a lot more draping and conceptual draping instead of super technical. Mm. Um, so many of the designs that we come up with actually don't have like the structure we were taught. So yeah. the straight grain and you have to do it this way. Yeah. I kind of believe in doing whatever your imagination takes you and then figuring out how to make it after. Mm, yeah. Um, and do you have like a can't miss experience that you went, that you did while you were here? Yeah, I used to go to the auditorium the, and listen to Diane von Furstenberg and Andrew Rosen speak. Mm. Um, and Andrew is now... I mean, to me, it was like this hero and legend and icon. And now we work together. Wow. So, that's great. Super cool. <laughs> from the seat, from the, you know, became a peer, which is pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> cool. That's awesome. So um, how did you go about launching your own company? How did you get started? Um, I Googled everything. <laughs> I incorporated my company on legal zoom wow. i made learned how to make the flower crowns myself i took pictures friends heads um i never raised money which a lot of people can't believe That's but awesome. it's, i don't necessarily believe in this day and age you need to have a collection to be successful. I believe in, I mean, my best and worst quality is I'm super item driven. And I think it's an amazing way to start because you can launch one it item 
and that can help fund the rest until yeah. you get to the place where you can actually afford to to produce a collection and have a team. Yeah. Uh, so I would say learn to do as much as you can yourself first. I have a friend called uh, who do I hire for social? You. you. It's not going to be more authentic than coming from you first, you know? Yeah. So. When did you decide you needed to bring someone else on? Like, what was your first hire? My first hire was someone to help me make the flower crowns. I actually got a big order from free people. Um, and we needed to produce a bunch. So I needed help to manufacture. And then... Once everything took off, I was like, okay, I need a product developer um, with design experience because I don't want to only do um, accessories anymore. Got it. Yeah. That's from there. So um, you got, how did you get that first order from free people? That's pretty exciting. Sorry. Is there a delay? I was emailing like crazy, but also Instagram had taken off by then. Um and I guess the C was much smaller. So we garnered attention. It became this huge Coachella thing. Um, and they took notice. And at the time I was like, take, I was like, take any order I would get. No, I wasn't good enough for anyone. Yeah. That's great. Um, so when you first started manufacturing, were you manufacturing in the U.S. or? Yes. And are you still or no? We do denim here and some accessories, but mostly China, India, and Brazil. Oh, wow. That's cool. And how was that process, finding producers? Because to me, that's always the most intimidating. So I, I actually, when I didn't have someone helping me, I found all my um, sourcing on Alibaba. Mm, okay. And I learned that at FIT, actually. Um and I would reach out to vendors. I would find my paper, my boxes, everything on Alibaba. Um, and then there's also a tool called Panjiva. And you can get a free like subscription for a month. I don't know what it's like now, but you can kind of see where else other people are making things. Oh. It, yeah. it's, um, it's like a database that kind of links you to where so, brands are. Yeah. Right? So every, every product is a barcode. And those barcodes are uploaded to you know a database for hts codes or something and so it's a system where it allows you to see um where people are making things wow cool yeah <laughs> um what's your biggest piece of advice for anyone who's thinking they want to launch their own company one day i would say just start and don't think so much about the end i would you know, do one thing every day that gets you there and you'll eventually, it'll eventually unfold into what it should be. Um, but every day I encourage you to do one thing that is one step closer um, to whatever you want to do and you'll start to meet people that can help you. It'll create momentum. I'm a big believer in the power of momentum and if you're doing nothing, there's no momentum. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, for you, what's been the hardest part about running your own company? I think people management is extremely difficult. Uh, the job stops being like what you, it's, you know, I'm creating here and there, but I'm also a lot, I'm doing a lot more. A lot more is happening through me instead of me doing it hands-on. Um, so learning to constantly inspire and be there for people, yes. but also hold people accountable um, to do the work is always a challenge. Production is a never ending nightmare. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a lot of different relationships, QC and quality standards and kind of obsession. You get, you know, first samples and, that's one thing, but making things um, at higher quantities to fit multiple sizes is very challenging. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And what's the best part? The best part is getting 
the idea to be a final product and when those salesman samples come in it's Christmas <laughs> making people happy you know what drives me is is that is giving people a reason to talk when they wear things and you know be able to engage with other people and ultimately making beautiful product that I feel like deserves a place in the world I don't believe the world needs more brands or more things so I would encourage you to think what what's the purpose why why am I making this does yeah. the world need this yeah so your flower crowns were obviously an initial start that really got you rolling and got your attention, got the attention of a lot of people in the industry, but really it feels like you went viral with the arc um, ah, yes. back. Yeah. Is that something, is that something that anyone can recreate or is there any advice that you have for making that happen? For getting that, like, viral? I think that's the power of just believing in one product and not necessarily being collection focused. You can focus, especially when a brand is small. Um, and with really good content and a seeding strategy, that bag actually didn't sell for like, I think 17 months. Wow. I was trying to liquidate. So I pivoted the business to having, um, I was basically a flower crown cart supplier. <laughs> I'd go to different events or, you know, go to different, like Revolve would have me and I would do their hotel event and would do fresh flower crowns. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. So the name got out there, but I had pivoted the business. I was doing bar mitzvahs. I was doing anyone who would pay me to make fresh flower crowns, but under the table, I'd be giving away these arc bags. And then one day, like we couldn't stop selling <laughs> the arc bag and we needed more. Gave it to the right person and it, it exploded just, basically. Wow. wow. That's amazing. Um, did it create a really big shift in the way you were operating at that point? It totally did. I was a free people brand. And then my friend had a store called five story in New York. Um, and it was higher and stuff, but she fell in love with this bag and she put it in the window next to a Gucci bag. And I was like, okay, this is my chance. This is exactly where I wanted to be. So I pivoted the business to be a little bit more highbrow Mm -hmm. uh, and ultimately like I told you I wanted to do couture yeah um, and so I raised the price a little bit it was still an amazing price um while it was still being merchandised with Gucci really, <laughs> Gucci and really yeah. high price points and then I you know I launched ready to wear so um what were you typically retailing your flower crowns for before this Oh God, the flower crowns maybe like a hundred dollars. Hundred dollars, and then you the arc bag. Once it kind of took off, the arc you, bag was like thirty eight dollars. Oh my gosh! Wow. Yeah, I didn't but this that. was before I understood margin yeah. and overhead and anything. Um, and then I got picked up by a showroom in Italy, and they had a lot of high end brands, oh, wow. and they're like, "Your prices are too cheap." Yeah, which it's it's funny that that can be a detriment, but it actually can because it keeps people from even looking at you if it's not the right mix with who they're sitting you're sitting next to. It's both, I think. Yeah, I think that's so much a part of the Kalk idea. That you can come to our website, you can still get an amazing like hundred fifteen dollar bag, and yeah. then sell couture dresses for forty five hundred or more. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Um. Mm -hmm. So at that point, when you kind of had to shift, was there, did you end up having, you know, was there a lot of changing that you had to do with your culture and hiring and things like that inside the company when you had this kind of momentum shift from flower crowns? Not really, not really. It just, for me, it was mostly fabric. Yeah. The website, photographs, branding, um, packaging were the true shift. Yeah. I'm still shifting. Ever evolving. Yeah. I'm constantly pivoting and evolving. Great. Um, what uh, you, you mentioned kind of a cultural shift from New York to LA. I wonder if you could comment on that a little bit more, you know, wh why did you get back, go back to LA? Are you from there originally? 
from here originally. My family was here. I was interning and basically they told me that if I wanted to stay in New York, that I would have to support myself. And I knew that I would get into a, you know, into the New York rat race. I would get a job. I'd fall in love with it and I would never leave. Um, and I knew that, you know, even though it was difficult, that it was the time to move home. And you know, it was great because I didn't want to move home, but sometimes when you're unhappy, it forces you to get busy and create. Yeah. And so, and, and you, have you felt like it's a very different vibe? I mean, obviously you were only in internships here, which is all, in and out so a bit more intense, but it's so, so different. <laughs> <laughs> in what ways? <laughs> It's just way more chill. I don't know. I, I don't think in a, I'm not that chill. So I don't think in a positive way. Also different sources of inspiration. When you walk out of your apartment in New York, you have inspiration everywhere, mm. everywhere, everywhere. Um, people walking. Um, I remember when I first moved back to LA, I was walking and the only other people walking were homeless people. Like it's the culture is very different um the grind is different it's like in new york it's welcomed and i mean even in design school it's like you work your ass off yeah. um and i love that and yeah. in LA, but you you get that but it's not this like culture of that it's different uh-huh it's not um ubiquitous not everyone yeah, yeah. Um, you have an extremely loyal fan base. Um, and what do you think is it is about your brand or the way you built your brand that's made this possible? Um, I think we were customer first always. You know, I never, I didn't have that many accounts that believed in me at first. It was customers. And that's the beauty of Instagram. I was direct to consumer. And then our buyers and wholesalers came after they saw that we had, you know, consumer trust. Mm -hmm. so I think they feel like they discovered us and they did and we are you know we listen to them constantly and are there for them all the time and you know are part of so many of their life's biggest moments um, so that's special how long did you do direct to consumer before you branched out um, how long? I would say I always had a little bit of wholesale, but very small, like very small. So I would say like two or three years until oh. it took off and everyone wanted it. Yeah. I was saying no to a lot of people. Yeah. That's to get hard. That's very hard in business is once you make it, you kind of have to when you start, you're saying yes to everything to stay alive. And then once you make it, I think so much of the success is also being able to say no. So switching those gears is hard. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing, knowing what the right paths are and who the right partners are. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, who do you feel like you have the best partnership with out there in the, in the retail landscape? Um, we really love Saks and Moda um, and Nordstrom is great. Our partners are great. I think wholesale though is challenging um, because buyers start to dictate what you make and it's very dangerous because it can totally dilute uh, brand DNA. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> and then markdown risk obviously you just don't have as much markdowns control. you don't have as much control so actually with a lot of our retailers I've started to say I'm going to do the buy I never thought I'd say this before but I'm doing the buy for you and it's consignment so wow this falls on me yeah and that's been working well for you or yeah it's going? It's yeah. working yeah um and I don't, I don't know if you know my background but I come from a long time of sales at Ralph Lauren and I was just telling my class last week that we, I mean, as a salesperson at Ralph Lauren, it was not like a conversation with the buyer. It was like, okay, here is your buy. 
do you need to make a couple of tweaks? Because we've already bought this. So you, this is what you're buying. Oh, really? Um, you so you can just that? tweak it a little bit. But we, like, honestly, there's not really much that we can do to tweak it. <laughs> well, um, you need to tell them what their buy is? Yeah, we would hand them the entire buy. Oh, wow. Uh, by the door, by door level. Uh, we would negotiate ahead of market what the um, the plans would be, you know, how much they were going to spend. Uh, but by the time we got to market, it was like, Okay, here, here's what you're buying. And I, I doubt that Ralph Lauren still ha is able to do that these days because I think that the buyers, um, that was not the norm with anyone else. Uh, but it was it was a very interesting first job in sales for me because I was like, well, this is fun. I'm still, I still feel like the buyer when I switch sides. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're doing sales, but you're also buying for them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they don't really do the job. That's yeah. So that's so crazy i'm so curious to know how that works see i'm we learning can, we can chat offline about it if you yeah. want to talk a little bit more I about love it that. um so now currently how big is how is your company structured and you know how many people are you and um how much is d2c and how much of it's wholesale we are 60 percent d2c 40 percent wholesale um and our company is around like 150 people oh my gosh wow how many do you have physical locations? Yeah, we have Los Angeles, New York, St. Barts. We're opening Miami and Sorry. hopefully two weeks and then the Hamptons. And then I'm opening the Palisades. Wow, that's great. And this is your first summer in the Hamptons? Or yeah. Yeah. Well, we were there last year, but very late. Oh. Our first that's exciting. Yeah. Um where are your biggest focus areas of growth? Are you focused more on the stores or? Everything. Everything. Uh, Throw it all, all at once. <laughs> yeah, we, we want to do like more, a little bit more international. Uh, and I think after maybe two more stores, I'll chill a little bit on stores. Um, we don't have investors. So all that, I can't invest that much into the stores. Um Without. You're feeding the business the way that you're actually making money, which is responsible. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So we don't, yeah, I don't, I'm worried about having that much overhead. I think that's really dangerous. Um, yeah. Which is the importance of a strong margin for anyone who wants to start a business. Your margin is absolutely everything and your power of your business is in your buying it's all in the buying. I had one bad planner, one, and it almost took me down. Ugh, when the inventory gets out of control. You have to be so careful. Yeah. So um, for those of you in the room who are very, very design focused and maybe aren't so sure what margin means, it's the difference between what you sell the product and what you pay for the product. That in between is where you make money, how you keep the lights on, how you keep things going. But if you are smart about the way that you set up your retail as compared to your costs, you can obviously be making more, more money on every single item that you sell. And a lot of brands that start direct to consumer struggle because when you're just selling it on your own website, it's really, you can have a shorter margin. There's not as many people to pay and mouths to feed essentially. But when you start getting bigger and you're going out at a wholesale and you're selling it then at a wholesale price, you make less on each item. So being smart from the get-go on margin um, helps too a brand that's really strong for life. <laughs> yeah. Um, have you had any cool travel through work? Any favorite places that you've been? I I literally built that into the brand DNA. Luckily, you know, we opened a pop up in Saint Tropez and had to go and open that store. That's that amazing. Fun, yeah. And then yeah. Bart's for Christmas. Um, so luckily, yes, the last time I was in China was right before COVID. I have to make a trip back. I have two kids though. Um, so it's very hard to be away so much, but we make it work. It does change everything for sure. <laughs> um, so looking, are we frozen? No, we're good. Okay. Um, looking back on your journey, yeah. what do you think is the most important decision you made in your career and why? Um, I think just doing it. Um, and I would say moving to five story and deciding, deciding to make Cult Gaia, which was like my sub brand, my, my plan B, my plan A and pivoting 
listening. What I wanted, yeah. Like listening where the customer was telling yeah, them what they wanted you to be. Putting ourselves in a box. You yeah. know, when we first start doing, started doing ready to wear, I had buyers say, oh, you know, you're an accessories brand, just stick to accessories. Now ready to wear is a huge part of our business. You know, then I had people tell me, oh, you're just a resort brand, just stick to resort. You're not, you know. Yeah. And, you know, now the next fall collection we come out with is going to be the best collection we've ever made. That's exciting. Um, and we'll cement a lifestyle brand. So I think not listening so much to what, only listen to people when they're telling you good things, not when they're telling you negative things. Don't let the negative things get inside your head. <laughs> Take it with a grain of salt and let it propel you uh, faster and further to what you actually want to do. I like that. It's great. Who is the most interesting person you've met throughout your career and why? Wow, oh, that's a good one. Um, I've met a few very powerful people recently and I noticed something about all of them that is very unique and they all promise you the world when you first meet and it's an amazing psychological strategy. They make you feel amazing like you're the only person in the room. And it's so smart for business because when it, you have to come around to actually terms and negotiating, you're not going to want to negotiate that much because you feel like they already did you a favor when they never did. Wow. Interesting. It's, it's <laughs> so interesting. It's, it's fascinating. Um, and yeah, I think I've seen that with a few very powerful people. Yeah. I I like that answer a lot because I feel like not only are you telling us that, uh, you know, about an interesting story about how, who you met, but also that you're kind of um learning from it in a certain way. <laughs> yeah. I observe, I observe obsessively. Yeah. People who are, uh, and study. I think it's fascinating. Also, I think most people I know who are successful move very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, anything they think of it immediately. Anything, immediately. I'm sorry, it just blew up. It, it answer, broke up answer, anything they think of, they do immediately? You were they saying? do whatever they're thinking immediately. Oh. Yeah, yeah. They don't wait. They answer messages, emails are fast. Yeah. So that's great. Thank you. Um, did you ever feel like you needed to lean on your, your network to move yourself forward? Of course. Um, so much. I feel like I've had to ask favors. This is probably my worst quality. I don't like asking people for anything. Um, that's for you sure. Investors. That's you great. Know. Exactly. I don't, I don't like any do. Yeah. Um, but anytime I, you know, I need advice, I'm getting better at asking. Very cool. Um, how do you keep yourself informed of latest trends or how do you get inspired? Um, Did it break inspired up? Inspired under pressure and chaos. Um <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I said I get inspired mostly under like pressure, time pressure and chaos. Um, and yeah, I, you know, like I need to work on my spring collection and I just become a sponge and I get insomnia and I can't sleep and then I'll get inspired by one thing and I'll draw that out and the roots of that out. But Inspiration for me is not the problem. Editing uh -huh. is There's a shortage of ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would you say is your style philosophy if you if you have one? Um, I think always make something that'll make someone look um and is flattering and makes someone feel really special and amazing. 
Um, I always say whatever we make should be something that someone doesn't really want to give away ever. Um, recently, I'm like, I want to make sure our products look really good on secondhand sites. Like yeah. that should be fabric and design structure and the tech packs. Yeah. Um, I love that you're so thinking about that. Filter. I constantly have new, you know, guardrails that I'm creating when it comes to design. Yeah. That's great. Um, I, I mean, that you, that was a great segue because my next question was, is there anything that you are doing to be more sustainable? And I guess thinking about the end at the beginning is one of the big mantras of sustainability and design. Um, yeah. So you're obviously thinking about where it's going after the first customer is done with it, but anything else? Yeah, I think for me, it's mostly making sure we're making something that the world needs um, and doesn't feel like a money grab. It gets very hard um, to not create products that become money grabs, especially when you enter a wholesale market. Yeah. Things I wouldn't make for ourselves, wholesale will commit so many units to so many and sometimes it works but generally doesn't but it's so hard to say no to things you know will book yeah yeah so currently my biggest challenge <laughs> <laughs> towing the line oh, yeah. yeah um what do you think is one of the greatest challenges in today's industry maybe it's that um, yeah, I think it's managing who you're making things for. Um, and sometimes focusing on them comes at the cost of not making more money. Uh, but I think it's more sustainable in the long term. Um, I think, you know, there's so many brands now that if you don't deliver on time and your product isn't perfect consistently, it's so easy for someone else to take that spot. You kind of need to be a really strong uh, storyteller, very, very strong storyteller um, and be able, I think, I personally think you need to kind of be able to do it all at the beginning. And that's definitely challenging. Yeah, yeah. But there's never been more tools. There's never been more resources to do anything you want to do yeah that is cool <laughs> blessing and a curse um so as a class last this is our first interview class last week we, as a class we developed four questions that we're going to ask all of our guests um and the first of that was what qualities do you look for when hiring and any tips to make one's resume stand out so i always look for people with a sense of urgency um, I always ask people, what what do you do when you don't know what to do? Um, and I like when people tell me Google. <laughs> <laughs> I like to screen for self-awareness. I think it's an incredible quality and uh, can show upward growth. So I usually ask um what would your worst critics say about you? Or what is one piece of feedback that was very difficult for you to hear? Um, and then a team player, I think is very important. Yeah. Um, for resume, um, I think, I saw this question and I was like, oh, I, I <laughs> at the beginning of the resume to summarize your experience, and what you want to be responsible for. I always ask people, what do you want to be responsible for? Um, and I think that that'll not only help you get a job you want, but it's also impressive to see, you know, I want people to work with me that have something to prove and want to own, you know, something in the business that's going to take it further. That's great. Thanks. Um, this is a side note, but I just noticed, did you know this new feature on Zoom where if you do this, it gives a thumbs up like on the screen? <laughs> no, 
<laughs> that kept happening. And I'm like, why is that happening? And now I get it. <laughs> no, it only happens for you. It's only happening on my side. Interesting. Yeah. Because <laughs> before cool. I gave you a thumbs down and I'm like, I don't know how that happened. <laughs> so weird. Um, okay. Anyway. Um, what ways are you currently managing work-life balance? Clearly you've got two young kids. So I'm sure this yes. is challenging. I mean, it's a rainy day and most people couldn't go to work. So <laughs> that's some work <laughs> balance, but I don't know. I don't, I love work. So it's, it's very balancing for me to work and be busy. Uh, that's just me. I know work-life balance is a very, um, popular thing right now and I think it's to each their own if you yeah. you know if you need that that's great I I don't know at this point in my career if I need that right now I have my kids who ground me and I do that I think that's my balance right I take them to school and I try to pick them up um but otherwise I really love to work yeah um if you love what you do you don't really have to worry so much about what you're doing outside of work. Exactly. That's great. Um, that's something you said made me think of something, but it went out of my head. Oh, well. Um, how do you maintain passion for what you do? How do you keep loving what you do? Um, I think sometimes taking a break does um, give passion back. Um, but fashion, I mean... You don't really, maybe it's because you don't come up for air really that keeps you in it, that momentum. I wonder like if I come out of the tornado, will I ever get sucked back in? <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah. Well, I'm you left to... New York and still in that. So you left the New York rat race and you're still in it. So you kind of. Yeah, but I love coming okay. back to New York. It's great. New York is very inspiring for me. Yeah. Oh, it's great. Um, I know what I was going to ask you. I was going to ask that on the work-life balance front, I think the reason it's such a buzzword is because of COVID and that really like opened a lot of eyes. Was there, did you have a big dramatic shift in the way that the company is run, you know, pre and post pandemic? Yes. There's a lot more work from home. Um, and I think that's the main thing. Yeah. And a lot, it's a lot more easy going. Uh, which kind of rip the bandaid off of this like whole idea of FaceTime and like being chained to your desk just to show that you're there. Even yeah, if you're exactly. the internet at the, your desk at work, if you're there, you're there, you know, it's kind of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. at least now people are getting stuff done, but on their own time a little bit. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. It's great. Um, and then our last capstone question is, or it's kind of a twofold question, but what's your favorite memory in your journey thus far? Um, my favorite memory is the fashion show we just had at the um, Academy Museum in LA. It was probably the biggest thing we've ever done. Wow. Very ambitious. Um, and I, I think it showed, I, when you think of where we came from, these flower crowns and arc bags, and then saw that show, I think it really showed people that we mean business. That's great. Am I able to view that on your website after we say goodbye to you? It's on YouTube for sure. On YouTube. Okay. I'm going to find it and we'll, we'll show it after we sign off. Cause I want to see it. Um, again. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is a moment of failure and how did you recover from it? So failure is an interesting word for me. I obviously believe in the importance of failure, but I don't dwell on it at all. Um, I actually never really think about failure I always maybe my I just do this as like a protective mechanism but I'm like oh it was meant to be or I wanted it to be that way or I just I bury the failure and I just move on <laughs> yeah. I don't dwell at all yeah in fact I forget like can't remember I started journaling so I can start remembering these things, but yeah, I mean, things have happened like we've shipped things wrong or, but I wouldn't say that. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you learned a lot on one planner once. So that was, <laughs> that was a good lesson. Right? Oh, yeah.
Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, those are all I my questions. Oh, yes, sir. It's very important to move on. Keep moving forward. Don't look in the rear of your mirror. Oh, we're delayed. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me now? No. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> we're back. Um, keep moving forward is what I said. I think that's great. Not looking in the rear of your mirror. <laughs> Um, I know there are questions in the audience, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Mm -hmm. Who wants to go first? Here, okay. Let me make sure you can be seen. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I know you said you started out. Here. Can you hear? I think you guys might need to shout a little. <laughs> okay. So I heard that you started doing fashion design when you were studying here, and that you said you said you wanted to start out doing couture, and then it pivoted to the flower crowns and more of an accessories based company. How did you kind of like shift your dream a little bit to like work for that, if that makes sense? Like so I had had all these sketches. I was going into cafes and sketching. And then one night I was having dinner with friends at my place before I was about to move home. And they were like, why are you trying to do this thing when everywhere we go, everyone wants these crowns and these headbands? Like, just do this and figure that out later. And I was like, okay, I guess you're right. And I just followed what, you know, I guess serendipity or what people wanted from me. And so I gave it this sub name called Gaia. <laughs> That's great. And I just figured I can, this is what, you know, this is what the universe is presenting for me to do right now. I'm just going to do that now. And I'll figure the rest out. Sometimes you don't know what road will take you to where you ultimately want to go. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Nice. Hi, I kind of have a lot of questions. <laughs> what should I ask? Can you hear her okay? A little bit, yeah. Yes, and I have a lot of questions. Is it okay if I just like rapid fire? Start with your first one and then. Okay. Yeah. My first question is Was your internships unpaid or paid? Unpaid. Okay. Do you feel like that's a rite of passage in the fashion industry? Um, I think things have changed now. I think maybe for New York, yes. It's hard for a company, even for me, it's hard for us to pay people to learn. Um, but then again, you know. I think it's everyone, flavor. everyone's different. If you're getting credit, that obviously that's what the legal way you have to do that. So, but I think it's harder for, I don't know in New York what it's like now, but it's harder to hire interns when you have to teach them because it hits your bottom line hard. Um, it hits the P&L. So I think, yeah, I think for a little bit and then you get some good skills under your belt, then you start asking for a paid internship uh, and you prove yourself and then you prove yourself even more and you, you know, you, you get hired hopefully by the company. It's actually an amazing way to grow in the company. You know, so the guy that I interned with at Jason Wu is now the head designer there. Oh, wow. Yeah. So good. You keep in touch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, now I keep it. Yeah. I keep in touch with Jason now. Yeah. He paid no mind to me, no attention. Yeah. <laughs> now that, now that I have called Gaia, it's different. Yeah. That's great. What's next? My next one is how was the transition from accessories to ready to wear? Like, where did you start with ready to wear? Like, how did that go? I hired a designer and a product developer with the money that we made off the ARC bags. Um, and then we went from there and then someone to manage operations, which was mostly like order fulfillment, helping place POs and everything. At the beginning, everyone does a little bit of everything. Okay, that's really cool. Okay, and then my last one is like, 
when you became a free people brand, was there a lot more restrictions to design? I luckily only was with them for the flower crowns. And then when they wanted the bag, I had, you know, evolved to be at these higher end brands and they begged me for the ARC bag. But this speaks to the importance of relationships. I didn't feel like I had an allegiance to them because they knocked off my my flower crowns. Mm. Almost exactly. Wow. So it wasn't hard for me to just say no. You yeah. Can have yeah. I love that. Thank you so much. Of course. Where else are there questions? Yeah, right here. Um, so you're talking about you're always looking at what you want to do next, right? So what's the next innovation you're looking at for Kaljaya? What's the next thing? Oh my God, there's so many things I want to do. This is my biggest problem. <laughs> Uh, I'm trying to not do more right now and just focus on creating these experiences in store and make our product even better. We've really improved the product in the past, you know, five months and for the product that's coming. Um, so that is my main focus. And then obviously I'll probably do more lifestyle things. Um. So, oh, actually, no, we are launching. Huh, um, I'm launching a fun little capsule thing uh, tomorrow Ooh. for Valentine's Day. Ooh, we'll have to check it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, my next question is, um, so you had the art bag and it blew up, right? So do you ever feel that pressure when you design another product that it has to be an art bag? Oh, or, yeah. You know, organization take that approach yeah i mean an it bag is lightning in a bottle <laughs> um but you know if something will be an it item at least in my world if there's multiple end uses and multiple muses that can pull it off and that bag you could wear to vacation, people wearing it to weddings every day, and then also every age bucket could wear it. And everywhere you wore it, it was viral in itself. People ask, where is that from? What is that? So I think that's you know the formula of an it bag. There's just so many more players now than there ever was. Um, but I believe that there's more. We've been lucky that we've had more it items in different categories as well. So, yeah. So, uh, the last one. That's okay. Uh, that actually brings me to my next question. You're talking about how the uh, product speaks to a lot of age categories, right? And the stuff that you design is very unique. It's not uh, something any normal person would pick. They need a sense of taste. So, what what is the approach you take to market research? How do you find your customer and how do you design for that customer? Like what's your approach to market research? I don't really do market research. Um, I think our customer just comes to us because we make something that's innately beautiful. Um, so it's a bit easier than having to spend so much money on marketing or, you know, hype because I'm not selling a t-shirt and people are just buying because it has a logo. I'm selling something that people are, are have an emotional need to have because it's just art. Um, yeah, I don't really do that. We kind of fall, like we hear from our stores, oh, there's a bunch of a lot of girls coming in for prom and we're like prom okay <laughs> right next season we'll make sure we have you know more options for her yeah okay. thank you it's cool. nice when you, it's nice when you have your own retail stores because you i feel like you get a little bit more direct feedback like that from your exactly from your you learn a lot. we learn a lot cool. <laughs> yeah thanks.
Um, so when you were starting out, I feel like as humans, we have a lot of like negative self-talk and self-doubt. Like what were ways that you like overcame that negative self-talk? Just don't just move on. And remember, like, I don't know if you guys and new one here remembers a really great teacher in elementary school or middle school that kind of like made you feel like you could do it or confident. Just raise the volume on that voice and come up with your own voices <laughs> um, and, you know, shut down the others. The more you do, the more opportunities will present themselves. You just have to do, not think, just do whatever you want to be doing every day. Do something that moves you closer to that. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know if you read this, but a lot of people have recommended to me the book, The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. <laughs> you heard of that? <laughs> sounds like sounds like that's the mantra, but <laughs> oh really? I need to I need to go to that yeah. book. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I have a couple more questions. So you said that when you were a student here, you weren't necessarily like the strongest sewer and you were kind of just figuring out how to learn your peers and stuff like that. And so how did you take that to kind of kind of building off of Kira's question? Like how did you take that? Because I feel like a lot of us can be very comparative with our peers. And how did you kind of use that so did you just use that as motivation and just like oh I was just so bad <laughs> I was so bad at pattern making I was so bad in the way that FIT teaches design I was so bad you know and I just knew I would never be as good as them and so for me like I, I, I kind of reached a point where I tried but I just knew it wouldn't be as good and I just accepted that and it was okay and not beating myself up over it, um, I kind of just blocked out. And I just had this this one professor's voice in my head being like, you, you aren't good at these things, but you're going to be successful because you understand what women want. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, I started with flower crowns, for God's sake. Like, I could make those myself. I was good at that. I found one thing I was really good at. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. And then my other question was, I feel like there's such a focus on having a specific aesthetic with your brand and kind of sticking with that. But how do you keep, how do, how do you choose the foundation of your brand while also being innovative with each new collection in line? Uh, this one's challenging and I'm learning every season. I think... Your brand DNA is built without fully you knowing it. And I'll tell you an example. When I started Cult Gaia and I was making the flower crowns and I had no idea that it would become what it is today. It was a product that made people talk. It made people connect. It made people say, what is that? It was instantly recognizable. Um, and it brought people a lot of joy and happiness. That is very much the brand DNA today, just a lot more elevated. Um, and so I think the DNA comes from you, I guess. So being authentic to what you like and who you are is important. Thank you. Any questions? Up there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, while uh, you you said that you create a lot of uh, when we enter your store in Soho, it's a complete different immersive experience. But when we go to North Star, Kalga is a very different experience there. So do you think it affects the brand uh, image or? Um, Could you hear that? Okay. A little bit. You but said, she's saying your, your store in Soho is such an immersive experience. Walking yeah, of course it does. That's why, I'm yeah. trying to leave. That's why I'm trying to make my wholesale experiences um, way more curated to what I believe in. I think wholesale is an important tool for marketing because you can acquire a customer. But yeah, I think the stark contrast from being um, in a department store 
especially on the contemporary floor versus coming into our flagship stores is big. But for me, at least we gain a new customer who goes into Nordstrom and learns about the brand. And then if they go into our store, they're like, wait, what? Um, hopefully our, I mean, I'm the queen of pivoting. Uh, so hopefully eventually we're, we'll be in the luxury um, departments. Mm -hmm. yeah. and the floors and they can give us the little get the presents you want. Sure. Okay. yeah <laughs> yeah uh other questions yeah down here what is the one thing that you're really proud of about yourself very proud of yeah uh, my ability to move forward uh do a lot at the same time multitask drown out you know negativity and make beautiful product with an amazing team. Right? <laughs> a lot, a lot to be proud of there. Did I see another hand before? No? Well, Jasmine, this has been amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story oh. and your vision. We're so appreciative that you took time today and I know you had some other things going on. So really appreciate you could still keep us on the schedule and my pleasure. Uh, so cool. I can't wait to do this again and I'm gonna come visit. Perfect. Sounds good. I'll follow up with you with an email and maybe um if you are hoping to stop by next week, I could help set you up with the foundation so that I would love yourself. that. Yeah. Are you, is anyone in this room like taking pattern making classes? Is the woman of the is the redhead woman still there? Amy's Berber? What's Amy? Her name? Amy? Does she have like the big glasses? Amy, what's her last name? Berber, she said? No, like no. Do you, is she there? someone who worked in um like with machines or no, we didn't oh, use oh. hand pattern making back then. Uh. <laughs> okay, I gotta come see. See here, you're looking for Guillermo. Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. awesome. Thank you so much. Hope the sun All comes right. out. Thank you, guys. <laughs> so nice meeting Bye. everyone. Good luck. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.